Number 1 My brother had a creepy experience with a house during his time in Japan. He sent me an email of the story. Instead of rewording everything he says and giving it to you in a third person perspective, plus I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste it and let you read it. Hey, I don't mind you posting about the house. Just don't put my name or anything like that. Don't put yours either. And don't go to any chat rooms or Skype ever. Chat roulette doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm only kidding. You're still just a kid to me. Anyways, here he goes. I'll try to remember the best I can. I guess it all began when my friend Jesse started dating this Japanese girl named Chi. We were talking about watching a movie about a haunted house, and Chi didn't want to watch it. She said she knew of a real haunted house. She told us about the house on the cliffside in a dead forest. I know what you're thinking, not the suicide forest. She just meant all the animals there were dead or something like that, so we basically convinced her to take us there. Just me and Jesse at this point. She takes us on a drive that ends in the middle of nowhere and next to a trail in the woods. There was a little chain tied to two trees that wasn't doing much to keep people out since it was dropped to about ankle height. All we had to do was step over it to enter the trail. Chi told us that she was staying in the car and nothing we did could convince her otherwise. So me and Jesse head down the trail and walk for about 10 minutes until we got to the point in the forest where everything got silent. It's not like it was loud before. I didn't even notice the noises like the sound of crickets, birds, buzzing of insects and things like that. When it becomes completely silent, it just hits you. There are no animals in that part of the woods. Me and Jesse just took one look at each other and we both read each other's minds. We turned around and ran. We ran without stopping the whole way back. I didn't hear anything, but it just felt like something was chasing us. I beat Jesse to the end and was almost in the car when I heard a thump and yell. I turned and saw Jesse on the ground. The chain rope that was ankle height had somehow caught him in the stomach. It left a mark and everything. I had to help him up and we got out of there. But fuck that, we were getting to the bottom of this shit. So we got four more guys together, brought flashlights and guns and went back. It was scarier in the dark, but with the other guys, we felt safe. We made it all the way to the end of the path this time. We knew that we were coming up on something near the water, because we could hear waves crashing against the cliff. Sure enough, when we got to the clearing, we were on the edge of a cliff. We were all facing a little house that looked like no one lived in it for at least 10 years. We went inside and found that it looked like the family that lived there just disappeared. All of their belongings were tossed everywhere, but that could have been from people ransacking the place. I'm not sure. But it looked like clothes, dishes, and furniture were still there, just left behind and forgotten. The most alarming thing though, and the first thing you noticed was the walls. The fucking walls. Every inch of the walls and every room was covered in ash, not just like painted in ashes either. It was covered in words written in ash and in some weird language. Latin if I had to guess. It looked like someone dipped their finger in ash, then started at where the wall met the ceiling and began writing something. Then when they got to the end of that wall, they made a new line right underneath. It continued until the wall met the floor, and they went to the top of the next wall. I can't imagine how much time that took. The creepiest thing is that Jesse told me that he asked Chi in private what she had heard about that house, and Chi told him that the legend says a mom who lived there went crazy one day and killed her husband and four children. She turned herself in and said she killed them and burned their bones. The bodies were never found, and the lady spent the rest of her life locked up in some asylum. It makes me wonder though, about all that ash. How much ash would it take to cover your walls if you burned five bodies? Would that be enough? I don't know. Crazy shit. Anyways, I won't be able to sleep after thinking about it. Next time you send me an email, ask me about sunshine and rainbows. Number 2 
When I was 12, my parents and I moved to another state. The house they chose was built in the 1960s by an architect who designed it himself. It was in the shape of a T, with the stem of the T being the large master bedroom. My bedroom being in the furthest left of the T, with also two living rooms separated by a kitchen also in the top of the T. The way to the front door of the house was to actually walk past a beautiful stained glass window that took up the entire east wall of my parents' bedroom and into the crook of the T on the right side. Needless to say, it was a weird house. It also had a basement. The basement had a deep freezer room, an office, and an incredibly creepy crawl space that opened up into a giant cavern of dirt piles as far as you could see with a flashlight. That pretty much made up the underbelly of the whole house. In the backyard was a giant slab of concrete that looked like it had been haphazardly added, apparently to fill in a pool. Now, I was 12, but I wasn't an idiot. This house was not child-friendly, and it was incredibly weird. It didn't help that my bedroom was so far away, and this house was so old and bizarre that if I yelled in my bedroom, you couldn't hear it from the other side of the house. Skip to night one in the new place. I hate it. I curled up in my little twin bed, trying to get used to the weird sounds and sights that the house has, and not really understanding why I was banished to this corner of the house where it was the coldest. The screen to one of my windows rushes in the wind from outside, and I take off running to my parents' bedroom. I slept in their bed that night. After a few nights of this, my parents finally decide I have to sleep in my own bed. No questions. I am given a little stuffed dog to keep me company who I named Sherlock. I was kind of worried about him discovering bones in the basement. Of course, I ended up taking off running back to my parents' bedroom and slept cuddled between two annoyed parents. Finally, my mom decides enough is enough. I can sleep in the room closest to the bedroom on a large chair. Now, this chair is right next to the basement door and also to the back door. I agree to sleep in the big chair because I have never been allowed to before. And also, it's as close as I can get to my parents' bedroom without getting them upset. I throw a million blankets in a pile and nest onto the chair for the night. Surprisingly, Sherlock and I do seem to fall asleep quickly. At some point in the night, I wake up to what sounds like footsteps on the basement stairs. And the basement door is open. I scream so loud that my dad comes running out. He slams the basement door so that he has a clear view of me trying to become part of the furniture. Why did you open this for? Are you trying to scare yourself? Dad, I didn't open the door. It was already open. At this point, my mom comes out to comfort me, but she doesn't seem at all calm. Her hands shake as she helps me get untangled from the blankets. She takes me to their bedroom and we fall asleep, albeit after a few bedtime stories. I wake back up to the sounds of more feet, this time on the carpet. I lie completely still and hope the noises stop. But then, I heard whispering. I nudge my mom and she just rolls back to her position. I then poke my dad's arm. Nothing. Mom! I whisper right into her ear. I then heard somebody whispering back at me from the dark. No. I scream loudly and clutch Sherlock to me, but neither of my parents moves. Something tries to grab my foot over top the blanket. I scream louder until my throat hurts. Both parents are still and breathing quietly. I stop screaming and listen, trying not to pant. I shake my mom. She is completely passed out. <laughs> Giggling comes from the door by the bathroom and I hear it creak open. The green clock numbers on the dresser glow against the door, so I can see it begin to move. As I remember it, the numbers actually start counting backwards, flipping slower and then faster and faster, until it was almost blinking. Two sunken eyes seem to glare at me from the corner, and I leap over my dad to the other side of the bed. The bedroom door is dead bolted. My parents did this to make me feel safer. But now, there's no way out. I hear the door bump against the dresser and I panic. I grab something heavy. It was a box or a book 
off my dad's nightstand and I throw it at the stained glass window and it bounces off. Something grabs my foot and pulls me under the bed where I fight and scrape and hit at the soft leathery thing that is trying to hold me down. I feel sharp pains and I hear snuffling like a runny nose and there was a flurry of limbs, almost like a giant spider. I finally connect with something hard enough to get out from under the bed. I threw the object again at the window, finally shattering it and I ran out through the front gate into the street. I run for a long time, making sure whatever it was wasn't behind me anymore. I then don't really remember what happened after that. My parents told me they later found me curled up on a bench at the elementary school about a half mile down the road. I had stained glass in my hair, a black eye, and my left arm was broken. I had numerous cuts and bruises around my ankles and neck. We moved out of that house as fast as possible, sleeping in a hotel until it was all packed up. The police believe I may have fought off an intruder who broke the stained glass wall to attack my parents. They had no other explanations to give me. The person I see for counseling says that as a child, I had to find something tangible to rebel against, since I was not happy about the move. The beautiful stained glass wall was the focal point of the house and was the easiest to fixate on, especially since my mother loved it and it was something really easy to destroy. The wounds I suffered were likely self-inflicted as I ran possibly in a sleepwalking state, through the streets until I ended up at the school. However, when I asked my mom about that night, she said she was shaken too, because the basement door had a key lock on it, and only my dad had the keys. They were in his nightstand that night, and she had made sure to lock it because she was afraid I might go explore in the basement and fall down the stairs. She really has no idea how it opened. To this day I still have night terrors of that thing with its dark pits for eyes, grabbing at my ankles and pulling me under the king sized bed. I still don't know how my parents didn't wake up through all of the screaming. My therapist says I must have dreamt it, but I didn't dream of the glass breaking. Surely they would have heard that. Number 3 I grew up in Keeling, Missouri. No, you wouldn't have heard of it. It was a small, rural, upper-middle-class community where everyone owned at least an acre or two. My father was a rider, and my mom wanted to keep horses, so this was the perfect one-stoplight town to settle in. I grew up there until suddenly in 1984, the government claimed eminent domain on all of Keeling, and we were bought out. My dad then moved us to sunny California. I'm a rider too, though I'm not as well known as my father is. I write informational pieces for online magazines and blogs. As you can probably guess, I'm barely getting by. So when one of my editors asked me to write an article on eminent domain for a well-known political website, I jumped at the chance. She told me I was chosen because I had first-hand experience with eminent domain and the buyer wanted a personal piece that included photos. I packed my bags that night, excited for the project. I'd always been curious about what became of my hometown. Anyway, before he died, my dad told me he thought Keeling had been turned into an airport. First, research. I was disappointed to find out that the internet was all but mute on the old town. Citing my sources was going to be difficult. I knew Keeling had been near Poplar Bluff, Missouri, so I pulled up Google Earth and followed 67 North to the turnoff for Keeling. Odd. The entire town was blank. Blank like there was a black gaping hole where Keeling used to be. A hole in the satellite data. I slammed my laptop shut and threw the mouse against the wall. This could only mean one thing. It was private and likely secret government property now. I hemmed and hauled on it for a few days before deciding to go anyway. This particular buyer had allowed me a per diem, funds for travel, and I might as well use them. Maybe there was still a story here. Two days later, I was driving through Poplar Bluff in a rented Ford Focus. I stopped at a gas station for some water and granola bars, deciding to check into the hotel after I got back from Keeling. I was looking forward to seeing it again. 
I took the exit north on 67 and drove until I realized I had missed the turnoff. I circled back, looking for anything familiar. I drove back and forth until I found it. Barely there, covered in plant life and completely unrecognizable, was a road. I had seen this street a million times, but never unpaved, which is why I had missed it. Someone had pulled up the asphalt and the road was completely overgrown. Bizarre. I drove the six miles into Keeling, wishing I had rented something with bigger tires and a higher clearance. Suddenly the pavement returned, and I rolled back into the abandoned business district of Keeling. It was small. A post office, a gas station, and a bar. All the buildings were derelict and rotting. Their decay far more consistent with something left sitting there for a hundred years, not thirty. I drove through the eerily quiet town with the burnt-out stoplight and continued down Route 51 towards my old house. As I passed the other houses on the street, I noticed they were in the same state of advanced decay as those in town. It was unsettling. Pulling up to the house I had lived in only 30 years before to find it crumbling and consumed by time. I went through every room in my old house for the nostalgia, but found nothing of interest. We had packed well. There was nothing left but a mannequin covered by a bedsheet in my mom's old sewing room. I was glad she left that. Those things were... Creepy. I left my old house and continued down the road, which by now had turned back in the dirt. Just why had the government bought this place? Why spend all that money, buy up all this land, and then abandon it? My stomach fell as I started to realize there may be no story here. I was going to return to LA empty-handed. I swore audibly. I counted house after house, Knowing I was reaching the end of the street, all were in varied states of decomposition. Some had even collapsed on themselves. The house at the end of the drive began coming into view. I slowed down to take it in, as it filled my windshield. I never remembered this house being this big, but then again, my parents hadn't let me go this far down the street. While every other building in Keeling was disintegrating rapidly, this house stood proud and palatial untouched by the decades. It was almost as if this place was stealing the energy, life even, of every other building in town, and maybe even more than that. A large, very clear and defined area of dead grass circled the house. Two dead trees stood skeletized within its radius. Maybe it was toxic groundwater. The windows were all barred, except for a small circular port window on the third story. If the government had claimed this town for anything, it was clearly this house. It was so different from the others, but what was so special about it? Smelling a story at last, I parked in the pristine white driveway and climbed out of my car, hauling my camera and laptop cases over my shoulder. I walked up the first four steps to the front door and was delighted to find it unlocked. The foyer was large and the house smelled musty. A staircase to the second floor was set right in front of me. There was a floor-to-ceiling mirror on the wall to my left, and a closed door and hallway beyond it to my right. I set my stuff down and took my phone out. No signal. Fantastic. Looks like I wouldn't be calling the hotel about my late arrival. I toured the house, snapping a few pictures with my cell phone as I went. The first floor had a library, a living room, a kitchen, and a dining room. All the furniture had been left, even the dining room table was set. Everything was orderly and oddly dust-free. Was someone still cleaning this place? The second floor had four bedrooms and another narrow staircase that led up to the attic. I tried the attic door first, but I found it to be locked. The first room I went into was the master bedroom. It was simple yet cozy and had an adjoining bathroom. I eyed the bed with interest. A sudden idea came to me. I may not have to leave Keeling tonight after all. The next room for the master stood with door ajar. This room was bare except for nine mannequins, all covered in musty yellow sheets like the one at my house. I snapped a quick picture and shuddered, closing the door to the room. The next door in the hallway was closed. I opened it and stumbled back in surprise. 
This room had a child's bed and was filled wall to wall with dolls. I circled the room, curiously picking up a few. There was those Baby Alive dolls, Cabbage Patch dolls, and tons of creepy little yellowing porcelain dolls. They all appeared to be looking at the bed. I snapped two pictures in this room, vowing to come back with my cannon. I closed this door too, and entered the last room on the second floor. It was a simple office that had green carpet and green wallpaper. It had a plain desk and tan typewriter, with a new white, not yellowed piece of paper loaded into it. I left this room and descended the stairs. It was time to bring out the big guns. I bent down to unsheathe my cannon when a movement caught my eye to my right. I turned to look into the mirror. I had known it was there subconsciously, so what had caught my attention? I reached for my camera again, and I realized what was wrong. The mirror, more specifically my movements in it, were somehow out of sync. When I moved my arm, my reflection did so about a quarter second later. When I blinked, my eyes were still closed in the mirror when I opened them again. It was incredibly unsettling. I continued to watch my delayed reflection when I suddenly heard a noise, like the creaking of a stair. But it didn't come from the staircase on the right. It came from directly behind me, behind the basement door. Someone was coming up the stairs of the basement. So there was someone here. I eagerly gripped the basement door and tried to open it, but like the attic, it was locked. I banged on the door but only heard silence below. Ah, animals, of course. Still determined to find a story, I opened the front door to unload my car and stopped short. What the? My car, which I had definitely parked at the top of the driveway, was now parked at the bottom, almost in the street. I had parked it at the top of the driveway, hadn't I? Maybe I'd just been excited. I couldn't remember. I unloaded the car and brought my stuff up to the master bedroom. As I walked by the sewing room, I noticed the door stood open again. But I knew I had closed it. I went to peer in, and this time, there were at least 14 sheeted mannequins in it. There had been 9 last time, right? I had counted. This time there were 5 more. Something was definitely going on. Perhaps it was all in my head. Maybe the air was toxic somehow, and that's why the government pushed everyone out of Keeling. Why was I losing it? I took another photo. By the time I deposited everything in the master bedroom, I was winded. I felt so weak. I had to lay down on the bed. This was unusual for me, someone who had nothing better to do most days than go to the gym. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew, I heard someone with a high, small voice say, Say bye bye. I bolted upright and looked around in a panic, eventually noticing one of the dolls from the little girl's room sitting on the bedside table. It was small and porcelain. Since when did they make talking porcelain dolls? I rubbed my eyes and glanced around the room. In the muted light of the setting sun, I saw someone in the corner. Not someone. Something. It was one of those stupid sheet-covered mannequins. I shuddered. That definitely wasn't there before. I walked over to it. Someone was fucking with me. I knew it. I started to raise the sheet to see underneath when I heard a loud bang from downstairs. I let the sheet drop and I started toward the bedroom door when I suddenly felt very sick. I dashed into the bathroom and threw up in the toilet. I wasn't going to have a lot of time here. Whatever was going on in this place, it was making me ill. I stood up from the toilet and splashed water on my face. This time, when I looked into the bathroom mirror, my reflection's movements were at least a half second behind mine. I waved my hands in front of the mirror, horrified by my reflection's slow response. I watched the blood leave my face as I gaped at my reflection in dismay. How was this even possible? Of course, it wasn't. What was going on in the house was, dare I say it, supernatural. Possibly. I mean, what scientific explanations were there? I wanted a story, and I had gotten one. 
I could be the first journalist to prove the existence of... What? Ghosts? Demons? Poltergeists? I guess it didn't matter. It was my payday, and I was going to need evidence. As I turned away from the mirror to find my camera, I could have sworn I saw my reflection wink at me. I grabbed the cannon off the floor and began photographing everything I saw. I went downstairs to reshoot every room, starting with the library. I started pulling books out, one by one, and quickly realized that every single book in the library was a copy of the Bible. Many different versions and many different languages. I opened a few that were in English and found that the word God was scratched out on every page and every one. It was getting dark, and just as I thought about seeing if the lighting worked in this house, a light flicked on in the dining room, pouring out into the hallway. What the hell? I turned on my camera to photograph the corridor when I suddenly heard heavy stomping. It was more than stomping. It was almost running. It was coming down the hallway right towards me. I dropped the camera and stood frozen with fear. Whatever it was entered the library and stomped right up in front of me. I couldn't see anything, but there was definitely something there. I could feel it blocking me from leaving. I slowly pulled my phone out of my pocket and took a picture of whatever was right in front of me. The flash momentarily blinded me, and when I recovered my vision, all the books in the library were now on the floor, as if they had been ripped from the shelves in a rage and in only that few seconds of silence, but I felt that whatever had been standing right in front of me was now gone. I picked up the cannon and took a few more pictures with shaky hands and then tiptoed my way out of the room. I realized I needed video, not pictures. I pulled out my cell phone again and opened it up to video. Then I walked down the hallway toward the lit dining room. I passed a painting in the hallway and caught sight of my smirking reflection. As soon as I entered the dining room, I noticed something was different. A noose made of stained sheets was now tied to a beam above the table. It was swinging back and forth, as if it were weighted. Nothing else in the room was moving. Even the beam creaked as it swung, as if it too was straining from the weight of something. I filmed it for a minute, and then raised the cannon for a picture. It suddenly stopped swinging, as if someone had grabbed it in midair. <laughs> I then heard giggling from upstairs. I left the dining room and walked toward the staircase. Did I really want to go up there? I didn't hear the giggling anymore, but I heard the typewriter clicking away. I happened to glance toward the large foyer mirror again to see that it was now out of sync a full second behind me. I heard the giggling again, and then something small run down the hallway and slam a bedroom door. On gut reaction alone, I threw open the door, intending to flee. My car was now 50 yards down the street. I was about to bolt for it anyway, when I heard another stair creak behind me through the basement door. This time it was closer, further up the stairs, maybe only five steps below the main floor. I shook my head as if to shake it clear of fear. Every journalist dreams of a chance like this, of a story like this. I had to stay long enough to get something on video. I heard the typewriter start clicking again and sprinted up the stairs, running full speed into the office. The typewriter had stopped typing by the time I got there. I ran over to see what had been written. I sat down at the desk when I reached it, suddenly feeling tired and weak again. The paper read, Jamie Ellis is condemned. Jamie Ellis is condemned. Jamie Ellis is condemned. Over and over again. All the way down the page. I took a photo with the cannon and waited to see if it would start typing again. Just then, I heard a giggle echo down the hallway again. I rose from the chair and left the office, stepping out into the darkening hallway. The child's bedroom door was closed, but I could hear shuffling and movement from behind it. I slowly opened the door hoping to find animals. Cats, raccoons, mice, anything. But it wasn't animals. Every doll in the room was where I had left it. Only now, all their heads were turned towards the door. They were all looking at me. <laughs> I heard another giggle on my right and noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. 
I quickly slammed the door shut and fell back against the banister in terror. I couldn't do this. I slowly got up, tired and shaky. I walked by the sewing room door. It was open again, and this time, there were only three mannequins left in the room. I didn't stop to wonder where the others had gone. I bolted down the stairs as something ran up, stomping the entire way. I had been wrong, so wrong. It was time to leave. I needed to get out. I turned the front door handle and was sickened to find it locked. I ran down the hall through the living room and into the kitchen, pulling on the back door and screaming in frustration when it wouldn't open. Where are you going? <laughs> I heard from the living room. It was the dolls. Jesus Christ, those fucking dolls. I stumbled into the living room, which was now lit by a single tall black lamp in the corner. There was a doll on the floor in the middle of the room that I had never seen before. Knowing that my fate was probably already sealed, I walked over and picked her up off the floor. Her head hung limp, as any dolls would. What did you say to me? I breathed. Nothing. What the fuck did you just say to me? I demanded in a crazed panic. The doll slowly picked up its head and smiled, breaking the stitching on its mouth. You're never leaving, Jamie. You're going to be just like me soon. I screamed and threw the doll against the wall. The lamp went out and I heard the doll run off into the darkness. I put my head between my knees, breathing hard now. This house was draining me. It was sucking the life right from me, just like the rest of the town. I was so tired. I walked out into the hallway to make my way to the foyer again, to try the door. I dropped to my knees in agonizing fear when I saw a sheeted mannequin standing in the middle of the hallway, 15 feet away. Tears poured down my face as I noticed for the first time that this mannequin had legs and feet. Another doll. It was another human-sized doll. They were all dolls. Not knowing what else to do, I got to my feet and slowly raised the shaking camera to my eye. Peering through the viewfinder, I snapped the picture, and when I lowered the camera, I screamed. It was now right in front of me, and it was mumbling something unintelligible from under the sheet. I ran, I ran for my life, down the hall, and this time, I had no reflection in the mirror. I didn't even want to think about where my reflection had gone. As I took the stairs two at a time, I heard whatever it was on the basement stairs take another step up. It had to have been nearly at the top. I ran into the master bedroom, not daring to look into the sewing room on the way. I fell down onto the bed and shook with tears. I had such severe muscle weakness at this point, I could barely move. How was I going to escape this place? I raised my head to look out of the window for my car. I finally saw it, in the darkness, at the end of the street. I fell back to the bed, weak and sickly, and slowly slipped into unconsciousness. When I awoke again, it was with a start. Something was weighing me down to the bed. I shot up and noticed that I had been tucked under the covers and the entire quilt was covered in little dolls. There were so many of them, all sitting on top of the covers, trapping me there, looking in my direction. But the worst was at the end of the bed. There, leaning toward me over the footboard, was a mannequin. I watched in terror as the sheet slowly slipped off the mannequin. I fell out of the bed onto the floor. I heard the dolls giggling and laughing as I crawled my way out of the room. I didn't know where else to go. With the windows barred and the doors locked, the only way out seemed to be the small port window in the attic. I dragged myself up the stairs, hoping I had enough energy to throw myself against the door to break it in. I found it unlocked. I crawled into the attic and turned toward the window, my heart plummeting into my stomach. Oh, there was a port window, sure enough. But between it and I was a sea of dolls and mannequins. They all just stood there, facing each other. There were hundreds of them. 
I moaned in defeated anguish and in terrifying unison, every head slowly turned toward me. I recoiled in horror and fell down the attic stairs hitting the second floor with a hard thud. The typewriter was clicking away again, but I already knew what it was typing. I stood up in utter pain and shuffled down the stairs. There had to be another way out. I wouldn't die here. I couldn't. All I'd wanted was my big break. What had I done to deserve all this? When I got to the bottom of the staircase, I dubiously turned to face the mirror. It was a half second behind me again. I studied it looking for some sign of weakness, something to tell me what was going on. I didn't know what else to do. Suddenly I heard a loud knocking on the basement door behind me and jumped. Oh God, whatever it was, it had reached the top of the stairs. I spun around toward the door in a panic and dropped to my knees in my weakened state. I happened to glance under my arm and saw that unlike me, my reflection had remained standing and facing me. I spun back to the mirror, but by the time I did, it was just a half second behind me again. I leaned forward toward the mirror watching it take a moment to follow. I even tried blinking, but by the time I opened up my eyes, its eyes were still open. My reflection suddenly sneered at me and slammed the glass with its fist from the other side. The glass cracked like a spider web and I fell back in terror through the basement door that suddenly stood open. I felt every jolt, bump and crack as I tumbled down the stairs and when I finally came to rest at the bottom, I was in complete darkness. I tried to raise my head, but promptly passed out. This time when I came to, the room was well lit. I was lying on a concrete floor, on a dirty tan sheet, just like the mannequins standing around me wore. Other than them, there was nothing else in the basement except for a large portrait that hung on the wall. I got to my knees and stumbled over to it. The portrait was actually a mirror or rather, was painted to look like a mirror of the room, and it was convincing. In the middle of the mirror stood a tall, dark-haired, solemn woman in a maroon dress. She looked almost familiar to me. Yes, it was her, Miss Harmon, a widow I used to see in town as a kid. But why was she dressed like she was in the 17th century? She had less wrinkles than I remembered as a kid but had those same dark brown angry eyes. The portrait then blinked. I fell backwards into a mannequin, which somehow managed not to fall. It had regained its own balance somehow. I looked around the room. I turned back in horror to the painting to see the woman's face slowly curl into a smile. Stay away from me! I screamed at her and ran for the stairs. I pushed my way through the mannequins, feeling their hands grab my shirt trying to pull me back. I took the stairs three at a time, and when I reached the top, I slammed the door behind me. My reflection was standing in the middle of the mirror, unmoving, watching me. I knew I couldn't get out of the front door. There was only one way out now. I dragged myself into the library and grabbed the first chair I stumbled over. Running back, I raised the chair to throw it into the mirror. In the second pause, it hung over my head, I heard feet, pitter-patters, and loud thunderous steps running up the basement stairs and down the staircase to my right. I could see them all coming out of the corner of my eye, but I dared not look. I threw the chair full force against the mirror as my reflection continued to sneer at me. It shattered. And with my last ounce of strength, I stumbled into the black abyss on the other side. I heard the dolls follow, but I ran and ran, for hours it seemed, until I finally tripped over something and fell. I listened for footsteps, but there was nothing but silence. Looking up I saw I was in the woods next to the house. There was nothing behind me or around me. I had no idea where I had just come from. I could see the house. It sat quiet and serene in front of me, but I knew better. Standing to my feet, I ran. I kept falling, almost succumbing to the darkness, but I pulled myself back up. I kept moving down the road, desperate to find my car. When I finally saw it on the moonlit horizon, I pulled the keys from my pocket and all but fell into the driver's side door. Not wasting a moment, 
I started the car and peeled off down the street. I drove as fast as I could out of Keeling, twice slamming on the brakes when I thought I saw a sheet-covered mannequin in my rearview mirror. I never returned to Keeling, or Missouri for that matter. At least, not physically. Even though my body escaped, I never did. I'm still there. Every time I sleep, or even close my eyes, I am back there, running from room to room. The dolls find new ways to surprise and terrify me every night. If I daydream, it's the same. I am only a hollow shell of who I was. My memories and my body is here, but my mind, my soul, is still in Keeling, trapped in that house. In case you're wondering, I escaped with my cannon around my neck, but all the pictures were empty, as black as the hole that was Keeling on Google Earth. Sometimes, even after I wake up in the night, I see a mannequin in the corner of my room. I know I'm in California, but I'm also in Keeling, in that house, at the same time. I have been condemned to it, and a part of me lives there. Every night in my dreams, the dolls try to pull me back into that basement. So far, I've resisted, but I can't hide forever. Someday, they will drag me back into the black abyss, and what awaits me there, I do not know. There's always a reason to be afraid.